If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Good. If you're happy and you know it, tap your toe. If you're happy and you know it, tap your toe. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, tap your toe. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Appreciate that to uh, uh, Braley and Forrest and David. <laughs> and Sharon, I can understand why Braley didn't want to be with them too. <laughs> uh, goodness, you don't know what they're going to get into. <laughs> Amen. They did a fantastic job, and we certainly appreciate uh, appreciate the little ones and appreciate uh, Carla and Tammy and Rhonda and others that's been working with them. And uh, I think the They'll have some more for us around Thanksgiving and Christmas, and so we're looking forward to it, amen? And uh, 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 let's give them a hand. They did a wonderful job, amen? They did a wonderful job. All right. Uh, well, at this time, now we'll hear from the large children, amen? And so uh, I think Dad has a song for us, and so Dad, uh, come on and uh, share a song with us. And I think after that, Miss Chris has got a hymn uh, that she'd like to share with us. And so be in prayer for Dad and then Miss Chris as they share uh, uh, some songs with us this morning. I would like to uh, do this song for a friend of mine. Miss Sue, she, she requested this. And this is one of my favorite songs. Uh, every time I hear this song or sing it, I think of my mother. And I just can't sing this song without thinking of her. She's been gone since 1974. Y'all ladies running around the house humming this or singing it or whatever. I didn't pay not much attention to it until later on in life. And now I'm 86 years old. And, uh, it still gets to me. I do believe that there are persons sitting here who would do what this song says. It covers just about everything and every basis. It's one called an evening prayer. Bless you, Lord. Bless you. Yeah, God. 
with you this morning. I'd like to return to the book of 2 Kings chapter number 7 this morning. 2 Kings chapter number 7, the title of this morning's message is Why Sit Around? Why Sit Around? Uh, beloved, there's a lot of people today that all they're doing 
uh, is just sitting around waiting to see what's going to unfold or what's going to take place. And they wonder, well, why is things the way that they are? It's because too many people are just sitting around. Uh, beloved, we need to get busy doing something. There are blessings out there in front of us. We just got to get up and do something about it and go get them and go receive them. Amen. And we're going to look at four leprous men who were in a no-win situation, if you will. Uh, uh, leprosy uh, uh, is, uh, is a type or a symbol of sin. And these men were leprous. And according to the Levitical law, uh, they were to be uh, cast away and not uh, to be around anybody. Kind of like COVID-19, if you will. Uh, practicing social distancing. And so they were to be uh, put away from uh, the society and from the community. And so these four leprous men were sitting there at the gate. Uh, no food, uh, no water. Uh, they were in a leper state. Nobody was coming around. They were preparing to die. And uh, we're going to look at uh, this event that takes place and uh, how they communicated one with another. And they said, why should we sit here? Let's get up and let's do something. No matter what we do, it looks like we're going to die, but let's don't die just sitting here. Let's go and do something about this. And beloved, they received great blessing because they decided to get up and go do something. And so we're going to look at this here uh, uh, account that's given here in 2 Kings chapter number 7. Notice here the word of God tells us, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord on whose, uh, on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God, and said, Behold, if the Lord will make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And he's pronouncing judgment upon this man. If we go through and read the rest of this chapter, uh, we're going to find out that the next day this man dies. He sees what takes place, uh, but he doesn't get to experience the miracle here. And notice here in verse number 3, And there were four uh, leprous men at the entering of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Assyrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Let's stop reading right there. And let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of the scriptures here this morning. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time that you've allowed us to come to your house uh, to worship thee in spirit and truth, dear Lord. And we are thankful for your word and for the truth and instruction and promises that we receive from thy word. And Father, now as we look to the bread of life this morning, I pray that it would be food to our spiritual souls this morning. Uh, Father, feed, uh, feed us this morning with food from heaven. And Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, that all of us here this morning would open up our ears and our hearts to the preaching of thy word, that we'd be closer drawn to thee. And Lord, I pray that you would help me this morning, dear Lord, to preach with clarity of thought and clarity of speech and strengthen my voice that I may be able to declare thy word and Father, if there is one here that's in our midst this morning that's lost and without Christ, Lord, I pray that you convict their heart of sin, that you draw them to yourself, and that they would come forward and be saved this morning and before it's eternally too late. Lord, I ask and pray now that you have your will and way with the remainder of the service. We thank you and praise you for what you've done, and we thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name we do ask it all. And amen. And notice here the condition of these four men. Now, they had been diagnosed with leprosy and for time's sake we're not going to go back and look at the Levitical law but uh, in regard to dealing with leprosy uh, uh, if one was diagnosed with this they would be brought before the priest and depending on the extent of the leprosy and what it looked like uh, they were to be separated uh, from, uh, from the community of people if you will. Uh, they were to come back and be re-evaluated re after seven days and placed back out again uh, depending on uh, how the how the leprosy looked and what took place and we're not going to go back and study that uh, but these men uh, had went through and uh, developed leprosy if you will uh, they had been exiled they had been separated uh, from the other people and uh, leprosy when you read about it in scriptures is symbolic of sin it's a type of sin if you will and beloved uh, we know what the bible says 
in regard to man and his relation with sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. We all have been infected by sin. We inherited that from our earthly father, Adam. Amen. Because in Adam all die. Amen. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And beloved, we get that nature, and you trace that all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Right. Now, beloved, if somebody comes up to you and says, I'm a mighty good Joe, I'm a mighty good person, I'm kind, I'm honest, I'm moral, I don't do anything wrong, I've never committed a sin, now, beloved, they just did. They just told you a lie right then and there. Uh, their, their, their string of luck just run out, amen. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we all stand guilty before God. And beloved, uh, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to get people to realize that uh, they have a sin nature and that they are sinners and that they're in need of salvation. And a lot of times when we go out soul winning on a door-to-door -door visitation or go to visit somebody that's visited our church or somebody asks uh, ask me to go visit with a family member, uh, sometimes you've got to get people lost before you can get them saved. Right. They have to realize that they're under the condemnation and judgment of God, that hell is real, that eternity is real, and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that the only means of redemption, the only way of salvation, is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, beloved, we see here these men's condition in verse number 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said one to another. Now this is an interesting statement. Why sit we here until we die? Uh, beloved, uh, these men uh, were sitting in a leprous state. They were sitting in a no-win situation. Uh, they couldn't uh, go back into the back into the city. They had nowhere else to turn to. They had no one else to turn to. And they're sitting there thinking, well, why should we continue sitting here? Uh, beloved, there are a lot of people today uh, that I would like to pose that question to. How much more longer are you going to sit around and run away and not be productive and do something with your life? Uh, beloved, don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let the devil deceive you. There is something that each and every person can do for Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're a child of God, you can be used to, uh, for the honor of God. You can be used to, in God's vineyard, in God's, uh, in God's field. Uh, beloved, you can go out and do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why sit around and do nothing? But yet that's what a lot of people like to do. Uh, beloved, uh, I hear this a lot uh, in regard to the secular workplace. There are some people that work harder uh, getting out of work than they do if they would just go do their job. Right. But they'll try to imagine different ways and make up different things. Oh, I've got to go do this. I've got to go check on that. Anything to get away from their responsibility on the line or the production area. Oh boy, I got out of that. What else can I think of? Man, won't you just go do your job and go home? Right. You're spending more wasteful time and more energy trying to get out of working than you are if you'd actually be working. And so we see here that these men are sitting here in a, in a, a no-win state, if you will. And they said, you know what? We're not going to sit here. We're going to do something about it. And notice that the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 64, verse number 6, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness is plural, are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Uh, these men were sitting there in a leper state, and as I mentioned earlier, leprosy is a symbolic uh, of sin. And so here these men are in a leper state. Uh, they've been exiled from the city. They're not being productive, but yet they're sitting there thinking, why sit we here until we die? I believe the fact of the matter is God's given, this, given us this one life. You're only going to live here upon this earth one time, and you're living it now. Uh, beloved, uh, one thing that, uh, uh, that is involved in ministry, and it's not one part uh, of the ministry that I enjoy participating in, and I don't know any of my other pastor friends and preacher friends that want to rush to the front of the line to perform a, a funeral service, but that's part of the ministry, and it's part of ministering to people in their time of need. Uh, beloved, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is... Uh, 
uh, when I hold a funeral service, uh, if I know the individual, if I uh, uh, know the family, I try to reflect back on those precious memories. And a lot of times I'll mention an account or two of the time that we shared together and the fellowship that I had with the individual that stepped out into eternity. I do that to try to bring comfort to the family. And if they shared their testimony of salvation and they go back to that point and place and time that they've asked Jesus Christ to come into their heart and save them, if I have knowledge of that and I know that, I share that with the family to try to bring comfort to the family to know that their loved one is absent from the body and present with the Lord. Amen. But beloved, uh, still their hearts are grieving and still they're hurting. And the fact of the matter is there is no preacher that can preach anyone into heaven. Amen. Uh, beloved, once an individual steps off into eternity, it's said and it's done. There's no changing that. You cannot pray for that person anymore, but you can pray for their family. Yes. And beloved, the fact of the matter is you're preaching your own funeral right now whether you realize it or not. Yes. While you're alive, yes, you're preaching your funeral right now. Uh, beloved, the fact of the matter is we're not going to be here forever. Yes, man was created to be an eternal being, and man will spend an eternity in one of two places, either in God's heaven or in the lake of fire. And the choice is yours, and you make that choice in this lifetime. There is no such thing as reincarnation. There is no such thing as rewind and coming back and doing it again in an alternate universe. Now, beloved, I don't know where people come up with some of the theology, some of their beliefs, but that's absolutely ridiculous to think that you're going to live life again in an alternate universe and have a chance to correct everything that you did wrong in this life. That's crazy. That's insane. And to think that you're going to be reincarnated to come back as somebody else or someone else. I heard someone say one time, I hope I come back in my next life as a dolphin. I'm like, what? Come back as a dolphin. My goodness. You know, uh, uh, where do you get this type of theology? Where do you get this type of thinking? The fact of the matter is, the Bible tells us it's appointed a man once to die, then after this, the judgment. Right. Not reincarnation, not rewind, not coming back and doing it again. I believe you're going to stand before God in judgment. And you're going to spend eternity in one of two places. We're not going to be here forever. The Bible tells us uh, uh, in Job uh, chapter 14, verse number 4, the Word of God tells us, Who could bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. A beloved man tries to clean himself up by his own works and his own self-righteousness and tries to bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing. We all are unclean before God. We all stand before God in condemnation. But praise be to God, when you get saved, the condemnation is removed. Amen. And justification and redemption takes place. And you're part of God's family after you get saved. Praise be to God. Amen. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1, And you hath he quickened. And the word quickened means to be made alive. Amen. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, beloved, you may be alive physically in a lost state but you're dead spiritually in a lost state. That's right. I believe that you go back to the book of Genesis and God told Adam and Eve in the day that they partook of the, uh, of the fruit, he said, in that day you shall surely die. Right. And I've had people come up and argue me. They say, preacher, well, Adam and Eve lived so many years after they'd done that. They didn't die. That, that, that's a contradiction in the word of God. You can't believe the word of God. God wasn't referring to a physical death. That's right. He is referring to a spiritual death. Amen. And they died spiritually that day. And their eyes were open. And they realized that they were naked and were ashamed. They died spiritually that same day. Separated from God. And it's passed on from generation to generation. But thanks be to God that God loved us so much that he made a way for you and I to be reconciled back to him. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we see here these men's condition. It's pretty bleak, isn't it? Nowhere to turn to. No one to run to. We're going to die. Now, beloved, I don't, I, I, I don't want to present a somber mood here this morning. I know, I know for Vol Nation it's already somber enough and everything. I was a little bit disappointed. Matter of fact, I was actually mad yesterday 
when Alabama kicked those last two field goals, I told, I told the gentleman, I said, the final score of the game is going to be 49-17 Alabama. And I said that Friday or Thursday, one or the other. And I told Christy when the game got going, I said, the final score is going to be 49-17. And then when it was 35-10, uh, uh, I said, I'm on pace. I said, I'm going to get it right. It's going to be 49-17. It was 48-17, I believe it was the final. Now, beloved, I know it's a somber mood in Ball Nation this morning. Go back and watch last Sunday's morning about joy, amen. You're still saved this morning as a child of God. Heaven's still your home this morning as a child of God. Uh, God's still on the throne this morning, amen. Heaven's, uh, heaven's your home. Hey, we still have joy this morning. Right. Even though Tennessee lost as a child of God, we still have joy, praise be to God. Amen. But the fact of the matter is we're not going to be here forever. We're not going to live here upon this earth. And beloved, why sit around and not do anything? We need to get busy doing something for God, amen. And notice here, verses 3 and 4, the certainty of death, the certainty of death. You talk about doom and gloom. Notice here, verses 3 and 4, what the Word of God tells us. And there were four leprous men at the entering into the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter to the city, then the famine is in the city, we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So here's your choice. Sit there and die. Go into the city and starve to death and die. Or go to your enemy and hope that you find mercy and grace in the eyes of your enemy that they don't kill you. And if you don't, they're going to kill you and you're going to die. Doesn't sound like real positive choices here, does it not? Now, beloved, uh, the, the media... And the world today and the devil today is trying to try to portray nothing but doom and gloom and nothing but heartache and misery and pain. Hey, Jesus Christ came to give us life. He gave us life more abundantly. And in spite of what's going on in the world, you and I can rejoice and have joy and peace in our heart as a child of God. No matter what's going on with the election, no matter what's going on overseas, no matter what's going on with COVID, hey, you and I can still have joy this morning Amen. and have a victorious Christian life. We just can't sit around and dwell on the circumstances, can we? We got to get them to do something about it. I love it. I love my mom to death. But my mom likes to sit around and she thinks of every worst case scenario that take place with somebody in the family or somebody that we know. And she sits around, uh, I see some of y'all acknowledge other people, I'm not going to meddle there, I'm going to move right along. Uh, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, beloved, if you sit there, you're just going to sit there and worry yourself to death over something that you have no control over to begin with. And let me tell you something, worry is just like a cancer. It can and it will consume you if you let it. That's right. If you just sit there and think about it. I've had people tell me, well, preacher, you just need to quit. You just need to stay at home and rest and live as long as you can. Now, let, let me tell you something. I'm going to be here and you're going to be here as long as God wants you to be here. And it don't make any difference if I'm working. It don't make any difference if I'm home resting. When God says he's finished with me, I'm going home. Yes, sir. And beloved, no matter what you're doing, when God says you've reached out a point in time and he calls you home, you're going home. But in the meantime, I'm not going to sit on the couch and sit in the recliner and sit there and run away and worry and think about this and think about that. Hey, I'm going to live life. I'm going to enjoy life. And I'm going to do all I can for God while I still have time to do something. Whether it's five days, five weeks, or five more years. But just don't sit around and say, well, I'm just going to sit here and die. I'm going to sit here and run away. No, don't do that. No, get up and do something about it. Don't let the devil deceive you. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2, and a lot of times I use this portion of Scripture when I'm holding a, a service. But beloved, there's comfort in this verse. There's a promise in this verse for the believer. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Uh, beloved, if you're in a lost state 
and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Why don't you get saved today? And I always give an imitation during a funeral service. Say, preacher, why do you do that? That's the best time sometimes to give out an invitation. Uh, you're sitting there and you're acknowledging the passing of a loved one or a friend. The realization that death is real ought to come to mind. And that you're going to spend eternity in one of two places. Yes, in God's heaven or in a lake of fire. And we know what the Bible tells us for a believer as a child of God. And another promise to be absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. And I think about friends and family that have went on before. I think about Angela Green. And my heart was broken when I heard the news about Angela. But Angela's not suffering now. Angela's in the presence of God. I think about Sister Charlena Ashburn. And I think about all that she battled with her heart condition. And with that metal rod that got put in her leg and all of her heart problems. And yet that woman did sit around and, and not do anything. She kept praying. She kept witnessing. She kept living for God. And when God called her home, I can have comfort knowing that, you know what? Her leg's not bothering her now, Brother Roy. Her heart's not bothering her now. Uh, she, all, the, all the things that she endured in this lifetime, they're, they're gone away now, Brother Roy. She's in the presence of God. Praise be to God. Amen. And I'll tell you what. We've got a We've got a home to look forward to as children of God. Right. And in the meantime, why just sit around and not do anything? Do something for God, amen? amen? And so now, we look here in verses 5 through 10. Notice now how their condition and their circumstances changed because they decided to do something. Notice what happens now. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. They said, you know what? We're going to go to our enemy. Uh, we're going to try to find grace, and if they, they, if they don't kill us, they don't kill us. If they do, we're going to die anyway. If they do, we're going to die anyway. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians, and when they came to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Notice how God divinely intervened. Verse number 6. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host, and they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Hey, let me tell you something this morning. As a child of God, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If God be for you, who can be against you? Praise be to God. Hey, victory's in Jesus this morning. Amen. And the foundations and the gates of hell tremble when the child of God stands up and claims the blood and claims victory in Jesus. Praise be to God. Don't sit around and act defeated. Don't sit around and be discouraged. Get up and claim the blood and claim the victory that's in Jesus Christ. Amen. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, and they left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. Hey, God intervened here. God performed a miracle. Guess what? God can still perform miracles today. I know God can heal my cancer. I know God can perform another miracle in this election. God can perform a miracle in your life today. He's able to. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent. Uh, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried them silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. In verses 6 through 8 here, you see pictures of mercy and grace abounding here. Amen. Now, beloved, <laughs> these men found a spoil. They found blessings. But if they were just sitting there at the gate, said, you know what, we're just going to sit here and die. 
they would have missed out, wouldn't they? They said, we're going to do something about this. And beloved, how many blessings do you and I miss out on each and every day of our lives because we just sit here and say, well, God's not able, God's not going to do anything, God can't perform any miracles, I guess I'll just sit here. The reason we do that because it's the easy thing to do, is it not? It's the easy thing to do. Notice in verse number nine, then said, then they said one to another, Why, uh, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. And may I submit to you this morning, this has been a day of good tidings. He said, what are you talking about? Preacher Tennessee got beat yesterday. It was cloudy yesterday. It couldn't go out and do too much. Uh, uh, it was rainy most of the day and uh, only partly sunny and uh, 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 cut back at work. And I'm not working as many hours now. I'm not able to do this, not able to do that. Hey, you're alive, aren't you? You got clothes on your back, don't you? You got food on your table, don't you? You came here in a vehicle, didn't you? You've got your family with you this morning or somewhere. You got family, amen. Hey, this is a day of good tidings. Amen. We ought to rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Praise be to God. Enjoy the day that God gives you. Because, beloved, it could be your last. It could be your last. So enjoy today the gift of life that God gives you. This day is a day of good tidings, and we will hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief shall come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Hey, they had received some blessings, and they wanted to go tell others about it and share it. If you're here this morning, you're saved. And you know, without the shadow of doubt, heaven will be your home returning. Can I get an amen out of amen. it? Is that not good news? Amen. Are you not happy and rejoice in that? Amen. Well, if you're happy about it, would you not like to share that with somebody else? Amen. That they might have the good news and hear about Jesus Christ and they can be with you in heaven. Wouldn't you want to tell your children, your grandchildren, your uncle, your aunt, your neighbor, your co-worker, tell them what happened to you that you got saved and got born again and tell them about Jesus. Hey, let me tell you about this place called heaven. Let me tell you about this Savior called Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about amazing grace. How sweet to sound. Don't just bottle it up and keep it, but share it and tell others. Amen. Amen. So, we can read the rest of the story. And they went through and shared it and uh, and told others about it. And they came into the camp and witnessed this. But the choice to do something. They decided, you know what? We're not going to sit here. We're not going to rot away. We're not going to die. We're going to do something. Too many Christians today are spectators instead of players. What God's looking for is somebody, some players to get involved and get out to the field and do something for the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. I appreciate you being here this morning. I thank God that you're here this morning. But your church attendance is not your service to God. And somehow or another, this, this, this misnomer has been placed apart. Well, if I just go to church, I've done my part for God uh, for the week. No. That's, church, come to church is not your service. Come to church is part of your worship to God. Your service to God, yes, may be involved within the church, doing something for the Lord, driving a van, teaching the children, teaching a Sunday school class. Now that can be service within the church. But you know something? Service is not confined to the church. It's what you do outside these walls as well. Right. And tell others about Jesus Christ. Amen. And beloved, there's something that every single one of us here this morning can do for Jesus Christ. Right. Whether it be hand out gospel tracts, whether it be sing songs, whether it be a prayer warrior, send out cards or letters to our missionaries, whatever the case may be, going to retirement centers and singing or sharing the, the gospel message. Hey, there's something all of us can do Amen. for Jesus Christ. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to make a choice That's right. to get up and do something. The Bible tells us in James chapter 4, verse number 8, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw nigh to God and he'll do what? Draw nigh to you. God's looking for some willing and obedient hearts this morning. Amen. Can you be like Isaiah said, Lord, here I am. Send me. 
Isn't it interesting that Isaiah realized that he was a man of unclean lips? We're talking about a man of God. He said, woe is me. He had unclean lips. He had to get right before he could do something for God. And then when he confessed it and when he got right, he said, here I am, Lord, send me. Is that not what John, James 4, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Right. we got to get things right. When we get things right, then God will use us. Amen? you got to make a choice. you got to make a decision. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Yeah. Yeah. Now, beloved, our nation's in a valley of decision. This upcoming election is the most elective, uh, most important election in this nation's history. And beloved, it's not about two men. This election is about what's right and what's wrong. And beloved, I've had people tell me, well, preacher, I, 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 believe in this, I believe in this political party and I'm going to vote a straight ticket and I don't care what they believe. I don't care what they stand for. That's none of my business. I'm, my allegiance is to a political party. Well, friend, if you think so much of that political party, may I remind you of one thing. That political party didn't save your soul and didn't die on the cross of Calvary to redeem your soul from a devil's hell. And if you love that political party more than you love Jesus Christ, and you can sit there and tell me with a clear conscience that you can vote for this party as a child of God and it not bother your conscience that they support murder in a, the form of abortion, if they can support uh, sodomy and legislate it and legalize it and it not bother you when God calls it an abomination, when you can sit there and they lessen the offense for all the LGBTQ people and say it's okay for a pedophile to be around a young teenager or a young child and not prosecute them for molesting them and you say that's okay and it don't bother you. The friend or problem, the friend is you got or the problem is friend, you've got a heart problem. You're right. That's right. You are the one that's got a heart problem. That's right. That's right. Maybe you need to get born again. That's right. Because if you can support that and vote for that and it don't bother you, there's something wrong right here. That's right. Now, friend, that's not endorsing one party over the other. It's about what's right and what's wrong. That's right. Neither one of them. Neither one of them. Hey, let me tell you something. Neither one of them is a saint. That's right. They both got their problems. Sure. And sometimes it's Choosing the lesser of two evils. Right. Or voting again. Maybe you're not voting for someone as so much as voting against someone yeah. and their belief yeah, sure. and what they stand on. He say, Preacher, I ain't got nothing to do with that. I'm not at Capitol Hill. What they do is their business. If you voted for them and you placed them in office, let me tell you something. All that innocent blood's on your hands. Right. All that legislation's on your hands. You say, preacher, no, it's not. Yes, it is. First Timothy chapter 5, verse number 22, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. If you vote for that and you place them in office, you are partaker of their evil deeds. Right. It's just that simple. You can slice it and dice it any way you want to. You can justify it any way you want to. If you vote for that, you stand for that and you're partaker of that. Whether you're the one sitting on Capitol Hill or not, you put your stamp of approval on it. And as a child of God, I don't see how with a clear conscience you could vote that way. But it is what it is. And that's one thing about being in America. You have the freedom to vote however you want to. And God help us. God help us. God certainly needs to perform a miracle in the upcoming election, does he not? He needs to perform another miracle. But in the meantime, don't sit there, get up, and vote, and do something about it. Amen? Right. And so, why sit we here until we die? Hey, we need to get busy. We need to do something for God. Amen? And so, that's all I have for us this morning. And at this time, I'd like to invite the musicians, if you would.
Musicians, if you'll make your way over to the instruments. I'd like to, for everyone, if you're willing and able, I'd like for everybody to stand. Everyone's standing, everyone's head bowed, everyone's eyes closed. I'll ask a question here this morning. Maybe there's someone here this morning and the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to your heart and you're here this morning, you've never been saved or you're not for sure heaven will be your home for eternity. <clears throat> Friend, if you're here this morning, you've never been saved or you're not for sure heaven will be your home for eternity, I'd like for you to raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not going to come to you and embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But I am going to pray for you that you'll come forward and let somebody take the word of God and show you how you can know for sure heaven will be your home for eternity. Anybody like that? Say, Preacher, pray for me. All right, I'm speaking to saved people now. Say, Preacher, when you pray, would you pray for me and my family? Me and my family have many needs, and the Lord knows all about them. And when you pray, would you include me and my family in your prayers? Would you slip your hand up at this time? God bless you. I see those hands all over the auditorium. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, you saw the hands that were raised. You know the needs of your people. And Father, I pray for every single person, every family that's here this morning. I ask and pray that your hand of blessing would be upon each and every one. And for every supplication and every prayer request, Father, I pray that you would uh, bless and honor each and every one of these requests that would best bring honor and glory to thy blessed name. And for those that could not be here this morning, Father, you know their need, you know their circumstance, you know where they're at. And Lord, I pray that you would bless them wherever they may be at this morning. And Father, I pray now that you would bless this invitation. Speak to each person's heart that's here this morning. Have your will and way. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. And now with the heads bowed and eyes closed as the musicians play, if you need to come do business with the Lord uh, this morning, I invite you to come. The altar's open. You obey the Lord this morning. some that's responded and maybe you need to respond whatever it is why don't you come give it to the Lord this morning casting all of your care upon him for he careth for you God bless you and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, I appreciate it.